Hi, I'm Becky Brunsman. I'm here to introduce you to a video that was filmed in 2002 of Hardy Trollander. Hardy was one of the co-founders as well as the president and CEO of Yellow Springs Instrument Company, more popularly known as YSI. He's in conversation with Alan Brunsman, who was an engineer that worked at YSI, and Dorothy Scott, who helped stimulate the conversation and ask questions. YSI was very unique in its scientific approach as well as its approach to employees that work there. I hope when you listen to this video you will find it as interesting as the people who filmed it. And by the way, you might want to listen for what YSI's connection was to those Apollo astronauts. Pretty interesting stuff. The premise of the work that we're interested in pursuing, the question that we're interested in pursuing, is that at YSI there was a particular um, atmosphere, a particular work structure, a particular... Th that was a special place where scientific um, uh, creativity occurred in an unusual way. And as one of the founders of YSI, we knew that you would have some things to say about that. Yeah, I guess I invented YSI because I had the concept and talked with John Benedict, would he care to join in? He said yes, and then talked with Dave Jones, would he care to join in? So we started YSI, not as a business, but more, in, in retrospect, more as an engineering commute. In other words, we were all equal. We had, when we went to corporation, we divided the stock three ways. When Dave Case joined us later in that, in that year, we brought him in as an equal, which meant that each, each of us had 25 percent since there were now four. And we went on from there. Uh, wasn't for a number of years later when uh, Fred Hooven got me aside. Fred was one of our outside directors, the most important of the outside directors, most important for the company and said, you know, Trollander, somebody's got to run this place and take responsibility, and I think you're the only one who can do it. And I would, and frankly, I was terribly hurt by that. Oh, really? Sure, because I was into this equality commune thing, and all of a sudden I was being told, in effect, you failed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But Fred was uh, enough of a mentor that anything he said I listened to very, very carefully and thought it over. And and then finally did begin to try to act like, more like a CEO than like a, 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 a member of an engineering community. That was in about 1955 when that occurred. When, when your ascendancy occurred in 1955? Yeah, yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. The company was found in? 48, June 48, 1948, as a partnership. David Jones, John Benedict, and Hardy Trollander. Uh, I believe it was in February 49 we switched that to a corporation. It was in early 49, and then I believe it was in July of 49 that uh, Dave Case joined us. <coughs> okay. We tried all kinds of odds and ends, uh, but I think Maybe there's one element worth mentioning here. <clears throat> we were really, really operating uh, as professional as engineers trying to be professionals rather than as businessmen. Uh, YSI really never was operated with hard business goals. And, and the basic philosophy was that YSI wants to make more and better instruments. And as simple as it was, it, that's also a pretty durable philosophy. Uh, it took us quite a while. <coughs> Some of the things I'm going, to <coughs> I'm going to put down as sort of pat statements uh, took years to actually for us to actually recognize that this was what was happening. And I guess the first uh, major product, we made a number of things. 
uh, the Air Force had a, a uh, bomb training program that required a very, very precise timer to simulate where the bomb would have landed by taking a picture at the instant the bomb would have landed from a camera aimed down from the aircraft training the bombardier. Uh, they didn't realize what they were after. Uh, the timing required that the settings be set to every 10 milliseconds up to 99.99 .99 seconds and that that last 99.99, the 9 had to be significant, in other words, one part in 10,000 accuracy. And we kicked that around. I had a real strong go around with Fred Hooven on that, who was all for, for electric clock mechanisms, and I just said, no way, not in an airplane. That was not going to remotely give that accuracy. Finally wound up designing what became a 16K RAM with an onboard crystal clock and heavy duty input and output gates. Um, the combination of 16K was actually uh, binary to decimal cut down to 10K. And then at the bottom end of things, the Air Force did not want to, anybody to be able to set the timer at less than five seconds. In other words, they didn't want that plane flying that close to the ground, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> it's a weird way to determine how high you are, but okay. <laughs> yeah. So anyhow, I used a 100 uh, kilohertz crystal and a series of Eccles Jordan flip-flops, uh, binary coded decimal at the end of the Swift 4, 12 AU 7s, 5963s. Uh, then going into telephone re relays, rotating telephone relays, because the electronic end of things used up too much juice and once we got it to the point where the relays could follow, when they sat around they weren't mm -hmm. using any electricity, what have you. Uh, that worked out very well and we made about three or four hundred of those things, I guess. The Air Force needed something now to tell whether they were accurate or not, so I designed an electronic stopwatch to measure the accuracy. In which case, this, this used the same 100 kilohertz crystal, but it was in an oven now. And uh, I carried it out to read it out in uh, milliseconds rather than tens of milliseconds, just to make sure that it had one more significant mm -hmm. figure beyond the accuracy that was being measured. Uh, and that worked out pretty well, and we made perhaps about 100 of those. Uh, while that was a I think that was my peak in terms of designing and executing a complex product with a fair amount of ingenuity but not much in the way of invention. From there on I tried to simplify it. <laughs> and and uh, from the history, I, you know, I can observe with a good deal of conviction that the simpler and more basic the manifestation of a piece of hardware is, the longer it will last in the marketplace. The more bells and whistles, the more quickly it becomes obsolete. Like the last, yes, last year's computer or last year's uh, hot rod. <laughs> uh, but I, the, in thinking about the elements of where things came together, we had also been building a number of psychophysiological instruments for John Lacey at Fells. And we had been doing very specialized work for, for Lee Clark. And where I think things really connected in terms of my own involvement was one night Lee Clark was getting ready to head down to Cincinnati the following morning to uh, try a, 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 a his heart-lung, prototype heart-lung machine on a large St. Bernard dog. The reason for that was the dog approximated the human being in, in size and, what, and lung capacity, what have you. And he wanted to measure the deep body temperature because he wanted to force his dog's temperature down to a lower temperature than normal to reduce the need for the brain for oxygen. In other words, just to be on the safe side. He was going to oxygenate the blood, but he also wanted to make sure that in case it wasn't working perfectly, the dog would not be requiring as much oxygen as, as normal. But how was he to know that he had forced the interior temperature down? We got to talking, and Lee and I just were kicking things back and forth, and I was 
allowing us all. I wasn't sure how to do it, and Lee said, well, how about a little Wheatstone bridge? We had already used thermistors for some skin temperature measurements for John Lacey, so we knew we were going to use that as a sensing element. Um, I thought about that for a while, and before the evening was over, I put together a, a, a microammeter in a box along with the Wheatstone bridge and a thermistor attached to it. And I said to Lee, we've got two problems. I can't calibrate this. We don't have any, any water baths. So now you take it over and you uh, calibrate it. And so Lee smoked the glass on the meter and then wow. just scratched in through the, uh, 37 degrees C because he had a big bath operating at 37 all the time. And uh, then I said, well, the next thing is we've got to insulate that thermistor. It's going to measure the deep rectal temperature of the St. Bernard. He said, that's no problem. He took a condom and snapped it over the end of the thing. <laughs> and there we had the first telethermometer, the first practical medical electronic thermometer. <laughs> but, you know, just a, a neat little series of step-by-step. Yeah. E -step but it's events. a combination. Yeah, it's part of the interruption. It, it, no, it fit together. Yeah, yeah, it fit together. And that was, a, in, in thinking about it, when I first was thinking about this was years ago, I was laying much more claim to being the sole originator of the telethermometer than I do now. And gradually, I remembered the interplay between Lee and me. And that was the, the point where the thing was nailed down. Well, that's sort of my point where I hope we're headed with this whole thing, is how do you get that interplay to happen? How do you get the people to, to you know, he's a different domain as far as knowledge yep. than you, and how do you get those two to go together? I had the yep. same thing with Ed Malloy. Because he was a chemist background and learned his electronics a different way, but you know it's that combination. Yeah, yeah. And it mm -hmm. happened quite a few times. So. Yeah. 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 Well, I think the next time that it happened, and I'm going to speak a little fairly personally because I think I am a little bit better at, at understanding my own contributions than perhaps some of the others. But uh, the, the next time it happened was with Waldo Esterlein. Uh I knew that these things were not going to go far if they had to be sent back every time a sensor needed to be replaced, and that was the it was for the first several hundred. Uh, I had remembered back in high school <coughs> laying out my hard-earned six dollars and ninety-five cents back then at Allied Radio to buy a little triplet multimeter, which was my first piece of test gear. Well, of course, the first thing I did when I got home was take it apart to see what I had bought inside, what was inside it. And here are these brightly colored resistors with big notches in them. And it took me a long while to realize that what Triplet was doing was buying low tolerance resistors and filing you know, the resistance up to, uh, to a precise value. Well, I remember that. And now if we can do that with thermistors, we're going to, as long as we buy them at a value that's too low, we can bring them all up to a tight tolerance. But how are we going to do that? Then the second thing that came to my mind was, well, if we can do this in a fixture that will also contain a thermistor so that it forms a half bridge and we just grind the thermistor to the ground to the point where it it is electrically in contact with the other one and it goes, it, we grind it to the, the point where they are in balance and then you, and we've got it. And uh, I was talking about this with uh, John Benedict who, I don't know, when I think back over it, uh, I could never get John to follow through on anything. I don't know whether it was my technique or what, but he was just not interested in coming up with a fixture to hold the thermistor. Well, I was back there talking with him quite often, with Waldo Esterlein, who was the one employee uh, mechanic, uh, machine shop guy. And Waldo got interested. And so uh, I talked with Waldo for about it for a while, and Waldo says, you know, I think I can come up with something that will do what you need to do to hold it. And so he came up with a needle nose pliers, which he then modified to have one insulated contact in the bottom, and that was going to be it. The thermistor was going to be held there, and that bottom side of the thermistor would be the point where it being measured. 
and the other up here would would have an insulated section, but it would contain a thermistor up here. And so when it came down here and the lead off, the lead off here in the center, we had a half wheat stone bridge. Uh, he also put a spring back here, so the spring loaded. And then we put it inside a lucite sleeve so to keep the draft off of it. And that was the first device for producing interchangeable thermistors that started the product line and still a major breadwinner for YSI today. Um, so there was Waldo, who all of a sudden got the vision how he could make a real simple fixture to do this instead of building up something from mm -hmm. scratch. And uh, incidentally, I did do all of the grinding, and for well over a year I ground all the thermistors. I ground more than 5,000 before I turned it over to somebody else. I just wanted to make sure that if anything went wrong, I would have some sensitivity to what I had done wrong. Mm -hmm. And uh, because I wasn't all that sure about the process, how well it would work, and how well the tolerances would be retained through the next steps of mounting the thermistors, potting them, what have you. So anyhow, uh, uh, some people figured that I was maybe trying to escape my executive duties by doing this, but I'm, and they were probably right because I was having a lot of fun doing it. Well, anyhow, that when I was thinking about how people interacted, Lee first, Waldo second. Uh, after we'd made quite a few of these thermistors, uh, I uh, Ray had joined us at that point, and Ray was improving the distribution very substantially. And uh, Ray Hillary had a very good reputation with the scientific apparatus dealer, so he was accepted into that community. Um, I think there ought to be a market for a line of these interchangeable thermistors that would be components would go into other in instrument systems and things. And Jerry Sterling was working for us at the time, and incidentally, uh, we had been buying thermistors from GE and then doing the grinding. One of the reasons I did all that grinding was these thermistors came through and and uh, they were in they were not very good. Jerry Sterling, who co-op with us, Antioch graduate also, uh, got doing some uh, lab work and nailed down basically the parameters that needed to be followed by GE to make good thermistors, and we passed that on to them. And they allowed us out, they really needed volume customers, and they couldn't do this because we didn't offer enough volume for it. So Jerry Sterling at that time said, well, well, Joel Andrew, let's make these things ourselves. And Jerry talked with Dave Case, and he and Dave were in favor of that. I was hanging back. I was in a buy, don't make mode. And I didn't want to see us make something that was already being made by somebody else. But in order to get a handle on it, we did get into that. And yes, Jerry was right. We were able to nail these things down to the point where we could not only make the what became the 400 series probes of the rectal esophageal, but also make them at different resistance levels. So I came up with a 1310 progression. Uh, that I passed on to Jerry, starting with 100 ohms, 300 ohms. These are all resistances at 25 degrees C. Uh, 300 ohms, uh, 1,000 ohms, 3,000 ohms, 10,000 ohms, and on up to 100,000 ohms. And Jerry was was a, a real a lot of self-confidence. Yeah, we can do that, he said. So one summer, he and I worked, hammered this whole darn thing out. I was more of a uh, overseer, as it were, rather than a contributor to a lot of this. But Jerry did come up with a line of thermistors that now, so this was in 1960-61. Those components are still basic parts of the temperature line of YSI. So these are components have been in production for more than 40 years. And standards for the rest of the world. Uh, other people are duplicating those numbers, too. Uh, yeah, yes. It, we did set up standards for that. Yeah. And uh, then I guess, let's see what I... Well, yeah, you have one. in your pocket... <laughs> I love this pocket. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 
here I have in my pocket a simple thermistor rectal esophageal probe. Suggested that you don't use it for both. At the same use time. One, yeah. <laughs> or one after the other. Yes, yeah. Uh, I had come up with this basically for the for the first thing, that the first one that we came up with to snap a condom over. Then we began manufacturing these. And uh, Miles Murray, who was working for Vernet at the time, was an Antioch Chem graduate. And, and uh, I was mentioning that we needed something to encapsulate these thermistors. So Miles came over one night, took a look, and brought along some of this resin and uh, dipped them. And now we have the encapsulation for the, for the probe. So this goes back to about 1951 or 1952, which means that this thing has been on the market for 50 years. And uh, by 1955 or 56, it carried the same electric. Originally, it was not interchangeable. But once we got that, then about 56 from there on, these things were interchangeable. 55. Where'd the 400 number come from? The, not the number 400, but the 52. I can't remember the exact homage of it, but anyway. Oh, okay. The, Why did that one stands out in the line? Yeah. All right. Uh, I was using as a standard 40 degrees C. And I, and I wanted to be able to swing a, a sensitive microamp meter in a Wheatstone bridge. I didn't want to use an amplifier. I wanted to keep it simple. I wanted to keep it operating from a single flashlight battery because all over the world we had those flashlight batteries. And in working with several of meter manufacturers, decided that, that uh, the best system match was to have the thermistor at about 1,200 degrees, 1,200 ohms at 40 degrees C. Uh, that was to be the top of the range. And the sensitivity of the thermistor, as you know, increases as the, resist as the temperature drops. So I figured that in order to account for that on a fairly linear, linear scale, we would want to use a right-hand uh, meter instead of the typical left-hand zero meter and so that's how that 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 whole thing got started that translated to 22 53 at 25 degrees c but the logic of it is 1240 and again you know looking looking back over it i've often wondered if i'm you know if i just thought a little bit more and gotten away from that right hand zero meter it might have made things a lot easier in life but that all fit together yeah. for the first time, and some of the residue maybe could have been corrected later, but we didn't. So anyhow, this is an illustrious piece of apparatus. John Glenn had to wear this throughout his, our first manned guy in space, and deep rectal temperature. There had been some bad physiology done, either I think by the Air Force, but I don't think it was done at right path. And uh, in, in, uh, Paul Webb could throw some light on this too. But anyhow, people in spacesuits simulating going into space, after a while their body temperature began to go up. And people thought this was a critical measurement that they would need to make. What was happening was they weren't taking the moisture out that was being exuded from the person. Mm -hmm. And this was make more higher and higher humidity condition and finally the body temperature started going up. Uh, but but people weren't sure that was the only reason. So they had they people had to wear this throughout the, all the space missions, right on through the uh, four or five person, five or six day Gemini missions. So for years and years and years, I used to try to figure out how we could advertise that among all of the suppliers to NASA, our products had the most intimate association with the astronauts. <laughs> Never was able to really come up with anything on it. But we had very close relationships with NASA, and NASA, uh, so we wound up uh, getting space qualified thermistors later on, and NASA did a lot of the testing for what became the super stable thermistors. Uh, but uh, anyhow, so anyhow, I guess I, one of my pride and joys is that uh, I, had, I had a, um, some kind of an association with the astronauts, but I hope they'd never find out who I was. Who you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah.
literal pain in the ass. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I've been going on for some time. You say it's, something. It's good. Well, <clears throat> I'm, I'm, the things that I'm extrapolating from what you say are, are of interest to me. The, and one of the big things I have the impression about is n no ego, um, which seems um, unusual. No ego and, and associated with that no power struggles. Okay. I don't know whether that's a, an observation that sparks any particular response from you or not. And my other, the other thing I would be interested in doing is either going, whatever your preference is, going backwards and talking about your history before YSI and what led you to YSI, or going forward and talking specifically about um, the ongoing interaction between Lee and YSI. So both, whatever is of interest. Yeah, both are, yeah, both are worthwhile. Um, Dorothy, the, uh, the ongoing connection is particularly worthwhile and as that occurred over quite a long period of time. And uh, just as an aside, I was very, very much impressed with Lee, but I didn't quite want to get too close to it. Because I figured our relationship would last a lot longer, whereas getting too close to him, we might become too competitive. And uh, uh, so one of, the, one of the things, Lee had an awful fight with Les Sontag at Fells, which led to Lee's leaving Fells. And uh, Les had picked Lee as his own heir apparent, which I think was maybe one of the poorest judgments Les did made on people, because Les was a good judge of people ordinarily. But anyhow, they had a long knockdown and drag out, and it was going to go up to a hearing at the, at the uh, Fells board in Philadelphia. And I was in the strange position of having been asked by Les to be a witness for him and having been asked by Lee to be a witness <laughs> for him. Oh, my. <laughs> and a, a part of this, I think, was because I was trying to keep just a little bit of distance. But um, I was both flattered, but I wouldn't. It was, a, uh, that was an instance of the pot calling the kettle black. And so there was just no point to being a witness for either, either one of them. But anyhow, that uh, took Lee out of Yellow Springs, and he wound up down at the University of Alabama uh, Med School, and from there on up to Cincinnati, back up to Cincinnati. When he was at Fells, he had some very strong ties with Children's Hospital in Cincinnati, and indeed that was the combination that led up to the first, what I think was the first practical heart lung machine. It's very, very dangerous to say that this is something that's really the first because many of these things are happening simultaneously but in any event the i think we can say that ysa made the first five commercial heart lung machines um, without necessarily saying that they were the first heart lung machine but the first commercially made and that was interesting we that was kind of critical it, it, that was going to be clearly an avenue of growth, but it was an avenue where we, first of all, where most of it was not instrumentation, but it was apparatus, and where uh, we would probably have to uh, dynamite the company to keep up with things. And so we decided we would work on the oxygen electrode part of it, and we'd work on the temperature sensing part of it, and the rest of the machine we wouldn't, uh, we wouldn't care to deal with. Those were critical decisions that he makes several times at YSI. Yeah. I mean, it, it was, we ran into those very often, you know, me only half the time, but anyway. <laughs> and that's an interesting decision to not ride what is a hot product because of what it would do to the company. There was a second reason for that, and that was 
John Benedict was the mechanical engineer in the group. Uh, and John was doing most of the mechanical work on the harp lot, but he was assigning most of the credit to Lee. And he did not want to have the responsibility of, of building that stuff in YSI. And he was the only one who was going to be able to do that. So that was the second reason why we didn't uh, go in that direction. And so I think uh, maybe it was a, quite fortunate that John wouldn't yeah. do it. So what, tell me a little bit more about John, just for, I, I, have, I don't have much history with, you okay. know, other than the airplane propeller that was in the machine shop and stories yeah. like mm -hmm. this. Okay, I'll tell you some stories. He, he was a dear friend, I think of him often, also with a fair amount of frustration. So John Benedict was one of the co-founders, and he was with YSI until his death in... In, a, in a 1959, I believe. I would have to do some double-checking on that. Right. And, and his area was mechanical engineering. Yes, yeah. And did you replace him, and, or did you have people who were ready to step up to that? Uh, both. Mm -hmm. But we did do some additional hiring, but uh, again, replacing John. John had this ambivalence about YSI, and he really did not want to come to work at normal hours. Now, Lee was a little bit that way, too, so Lee and John worked well together. But John would often not come in until the evening, and then would work through the night. Uh, which made it very hard, again, to to, to coordinate things yes. with him. So we did not replace him. Yeah. Was there another piece of that? No, I, I see him. Was he the interface with Lee on the Heartline machine then? Yes. He was the person that sort of lived with Lee for a while. That's right. Who yeah. did the electronics on that? Do you do the electronics on Some that? Some of that, yeah. It's a conductivity cell and there's a well, they, they, conductivity they, level meter. And, you know, and the temperature control. Yeah, temperature control. Te temperature readout, that was, was mine. Okay. Yeah. How was that structured at the time? I don't know. It just three guys, four guys, I don't know how many people there were just together working on it or... Yes. Yeah, John and Lee were working together. I was more to one side on that. So when it came time to, uh, to nail down the temperature part of it, I just modified one of these thermometers for it and a temperature controller design that I'd been fooling around with. So I would say that John was much more hands-on than I, way, up, way more hands-on on that whole thing. But he got along with Lee. Yes. Uh huh. Yeah. Very well. Yeah. You know, not to badmouth Lee in any way, but it does take a different personality to get along with Lee. Yeah. And and John respected Lee's inventiveness and commitment to new things. So that was a great motivator for John. I'm interested in what you said earlier about deciding not to get too close to Lee because of the concern that you would become competitive. And I, I don't want to assume that I understand what you mean by that. I would appreciate if you would talk about that a little more. Uh, I'm not sure I can, I understand myself. Uh, work, uh, Fells had a great bunch of folks back in those days. John and B. Lacey were doing a tremendous job in psychophysiology. Vaughn Crandall, uh, Lee, of course, and half a dozen others. Really outstanding scientists. Many of them were young <coughs> and were using Fells as a stepping stone for going forward with their careers. Jerry Kagan, for example was at Fells. It was clear that Jerry was was really, in effect, breaking himself in for the big time at Fells and doing a damn good job. 
Uh, what was Lee doing there at the time? Well, Lee was heading their biochemistry, and uh, Lee was, again, very much interested in artificial heart-lung development, uh, very much interested in, very much motivated toward inventing things that would, put it crudely, help save people who were in bad, in bad shape. He was motivated to help preemies to survive, as you probably remember. And uh, I felt that probably getting as close to Lee as John was close to Lee, that one that would interfere with my up my heading YSI, uh, because it was a very close connection that Lee and John had. And uh, two, that it might interfere with some of the relationships I had with some of the other people at Falls to be perceived as, as uh, working very, very closely with Lee and therefore not as closely as some of the others. Hmm. But, you know, that's kind of lame, Dorothy. I really can't put my finger on it myself. Okay. Well, I had the same feeling with you know, my interaction with Lee was that you had to keep, we worked better when we weren't in the same company. Yeah, you got it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Lee has a strong mind, I don't know, when we did the glucose, I was at YSI and Lee was at Children's, okay. And, you know, Lee could do his thing as much independently as he wanted to, and we could do our thing as much independently as we wanted to. Yeah. And it gave us the ability to both do it. Yeah. And we ended up diverting and coming back together and diverting and coming back together. And that, that worked. But yeah, if you yes. had one mind, and Lee would pr try to be the one mind. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. You would try to follow his path. And yeah. you can't, you've got to have the, this is back to the separation of engineers and scientists. Yeah. They're different people. They have different motives. They have different goals. Yeah. And you got to keep that independence. Mm -hmm. I'm stating it well. Okay. okay. <laughs> well, I felt it. <laughs> I've, I've been in a company with him, too. So. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I'm just beginning to think that that is a critical piece of why, why the creativity and this kind of magic occurred because there was an awareness of elements that maybe others aren't aware of. I mean, that, that, that may well be. Um, do, do, will you talk about some of the other products, things that became products, stories that led up to? Sure, but let me toss in something that you may want to edit out. Uh, in terms of what what caused the, this creativity to happen, etc., the Cavendish Lab over in England was the premier physics lab of the whole world for a number of generations. The stuff that came out of the Cavendish was superb. People have tried to a analyze the Cavendish to see why it was that occurred, and it seems to be mostly coincidental. Uh, later on, Bell Labs through the 20s uh, through the 60s was a center of superb excellence here in the USA. Transistor came from there. A lot, a lot of the ther early thermistor work came from there. A whole flock of things came from there. People tried to analyze that. They haven't been able to put their finger on what happened there. And I think it was the coincidence of a number of individuals within a framework of some sort that allowed whatever they were going to become for them to self-determine that rather than some higher order telling them what they had to do. Yeah, it's sort of guided chaos. Yeah. <laughs> How's that? Good term. Sure. <laughs> uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah. But, but that's, you know, it's, it's an important degree. I mean, it happens in all of them. It's, it's a, the people have got to have the independence to fail. And yet they got to have the guidance to, you know, every once in a while they got to be aimed back to the right direction. Yeah. And I think that's an important ingredient of the whole thing. Yeah. Hmm. 
So, did were you interested in in talking about some of the other product or and we can't all, can't do all of this on one tape, but I'm also very interested in in what preceded the invention of YSI. So, either way that you well, want to go now. Okay. Well, well, we'll do that preceded uh, invention of YSI. Uh, I had made a few inventions on my own. Uh, the one which was interesting was a free piston gas turbine back in 1940 when I was taking mechanics at Antioch. And the prow fell out is how it wouldn't work. Well, I knew it would work, but I didn't think it was a very good engine, so I didn't pursue it. If I had pursued it, I would have found that a Frenchman patented it three years earlier. <laughs> And, uh, and many companies invested a lot of money in that engine design immediately after World War II, and it came to nothing. So I felt really pleased that I decided it wasn't <laughs> going to be a good engine. <laughs> but anyhow, my father had been uh, a chemist, and he had a few patents under his belt. And uh, I'd, been, I'd been intrigued with elec electronics and figured there were some possibilities here in the future. Went to Antioch, you know, was dropped out for three years to be in the Air Force in World War II, and then came on back. Jean and I got married fairly soon after that, and Jean had a uh, year or two to go. So Billy Owen asked me, I graduated in 47, Jean was going to graduate in 48. Billy Owen, who headed the physics department, asked me if I would teach for a year, 47, 48. Uh, because there was a hole that needed filling, and I was a sucker. I, I allowed to say, yes, I would do that. I learned physics that way, but I learned it the hard way. <laughs> it's the best way to learn, I agree. Yeah, and, and man, did I work on that. It's the hardest I've ever worked in my life. And when everybody, anybody says, you know, if you can't do it, you can teach it, I get ready to blast it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I really believe in that. I really think, it's just, you know, you learn it, you got to answer questions. If yeah. you can't answer them, you look it up. You know, yeah. it just, yeah. Yeah. it forces you to. Yeah. Precisely. But, so anyhow, at the end of that year, Jean had been offered a job. She'd been working part-time at the Antioch School, had been offered a job there, and she wanted to stick around for a while. I'd been accepted at Caltech, and we had figured we'd go on out to, to Pasadena, but uh, Jean wanted to stay, and so that's when I began figuring, well, what will we do? Let's start this engineering thing and see what happens. It was not pl planned to be a career. Hmm. YSI was not planned to be a survivor. And Benedict put it as well as anybody when we talked about it. He'd been reading an article that nine out of ten new businesses failed. As far as an engineering answer was concerned, obviously we were going to be one of the nine. Right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But you know, but we might as well fail while we're young and get that out of get, get that, that out of the us. way. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so anyhow, you asked how YSI got started. Basically, that's how it got started. It was it was started by my temporizing so that Jane could work at the Antioch School, where incidentally she was, she had provided Coretta Scott King with her practice teaching. Yeah. Yes, the historical connections are fascinating. Oh, weird, aren't they? Yeah. yeah. And, um, and of course, the mythology at Antioch College it, it is great. Much is made of the fact that YSI began in the basement. And that's of true. The science building. Yeah, it should be. Uh, <laughs> Arthur Morgan caused things like that to happen. And there was a carryover with Al Joe Henderson and also with, uh, with McGregor. Uh, but here Antioch was being looked down on by the surrounding Miami Valley as a hotbed of communism and free love. It was a prime uh, instigator of entrepreneurialism. And so when we, got, when we wanted to get started, talked with Owen and Barbalesco, who was the E prof, and sure we could use some space there, that would be okay. Before too long, I was arguing with Mort Rao, who was the business manager then, that we needed to pay more rent because we were using enough electricity that we knew we needed to pay more rent. And more, I was, yes, was afraid of getting it on the tax duplicate. <laughs> and so more didn't raise our rent. <laughs> and he didn't. That's funny. Uh, but, you know, down the hall, Vernet had started the other end of the science building. 
Morris Bain uh, was working on a co-op job with Amos Mazzolini. Amos was using the lost wax uh, process for, for statuary casting, bronze casting, and Morris saw industrial applications of that. And all of this was being aided and abetted by Morgan's great expansiveness and Morgan's belief that people could always do things more than and better than they were doing at the moment if, if they had, were given their heads sort of thing. And where did you get the money? I assumed you had to buy some things. Well, we talked and allowed us how, how it would be if we could use some of the college's apparatus and then the college could use some of our apparatus, and that was the case. And so it was a one-way street to begin with before we were done, before we left the college. The college was using a fair amount of our stuff. But so we, we each tossed in a hundred bucks, and that was what started YSI, three hundred dollars original capital. Yeah. Of course, it was worth more now than Yeah, a lot more. <laughs> <laughs> even so. <laughs> and how long were you there? Uh, June 48 through uh, into about the middle of 1951, middle to the latter part of 51. We were built, wound up building those uh, camera timers. And they were taking up a lot of space, and we were using extra space. It was clear that we were getting at a point where the building limitations were being imposed on us, and we were uh, take, taking up too much space for the college's purposes. And what was your first sale from the basement of Antioch College? I don't remember. Uh, one of the very early sales was a tachistoscope timer. A small outfit in Dayton had got a contract from the Aerobed Lab to make these tachistoscopes, and they needed somebody to make the timer. Fred Hooven knew that outfit, was working with us, because Fred was working at Fells as, and also was an Antioch trustee for a while. But uh, so Fred uh, got us together when we designed a simple RC resistance capacitance timer. That was all that was needed, a few percent accuracy. Uh, and I think we made four or five of those. In total, less than $1,000. Uh, we did a lot of things. We uh, took on a maintenance contract for some of the college's uh, electronics. Or, Victrolas and things like that in the common rooms. If, you know, we were engineers; we could do anything. On the other hand, we would were willing to do anything if we could get some food out of it. <laughs> yeah. did, did you have anyone who was um, doing what now is called uh, marketing? And yeah, in the early days, I was trying to do a fair amount of that. Uh, later on. We took on a guy who, young guy who'd just been discharged from the Air Force, Bob Butters, who became our first sales manager. Bob was also <coughs> a musician on the side, and every now and then comes back and plays with the jazz groups here. Oh, he's still around? Yeah, Bob I believe Butters? so, living in Columbus. I think I've met him. Yeah. Yeah. And he was your first sales manager? Yeah, and Bob uh, was a real believer in the telethermometer. So there were Within YSI, there were only two people who were believers of that, Butters and, and I. Yeah. Yeah, that this was a product that had a future. Hmm. But Bob was, uh, Bob was not, not able to direct our marketing. Bob, Bob was, uh, I would classify Bob as a <coughs> very fine guy and a first-rate salesman, not a marketeer. Mm -hmm. Ray Schiff was the marketeer. Was he the, f the first person? Yeah, he person? came in after, after Bob. Ray came in in 1957. So the company was just nine years old. Gosh, I didn't realize that he was there that... Yeah. And Ray, uh, getting, having Ray join YSI was interesting. I pirated Ray from Beckman Instruments. Uh, We'd been making the first oxygen electrodes, as you know, and we uh, 
were making them as experimental electrodes. It was really the first manifestation of Lee's design. It's still a product. And sometimes I have the feeling that the first manifestation of something is likely to be the most natural manifestation and therefore is likely to have a very long life in the marketplace. Uh, another one of troll and his homilies. <laughs> uh, but anyhow, uh, Beckman got interested in that. Uh, through a combination, first of Lee's technical papers, I believe it was in 1956 at the Federated Societies for Experimental Biology meeting in Atlantic City, where Lee had a paper on the oxygen electrode. We had one in our booth. I think that was the first time we were, must have been 57, because Ray was already with us then. Uh, and the doctor from the Karolinska Institute sat in on Lee's paper and, and heard that we might have one and came over and was insisting on buying it. We wouldn't sell it to him without Lee's permission. Lee gave it permission, and so our first sale went to the Karolinska Institute. <laughs> That's so interesting. <clears throat> yeah, well, Lee had asked us to have a couple of them around to be able to demonstrate them if necessary, but we weren't, we weren't in a position to sell them. So. And then, anyhow, that's the way the first sale occurred. Uh, and that, of course, led to a, a, a whole series of products. But uh, what happened was that uh, someone at Beckman, uh, John Leonard, was another Antioch graduate mm -hmm. who had done postdocs out in California, had gotten his doctor's degree from Ohio State as part of the Kettering scholarship arrangement and then did a postdoc out in California and was at Beckman. And I think John spotted the uh, this oxygen electrode and realized its potential. Anyhow, Beckman approached Lee. And Beckman, of course, said, we've got a lot of muscle and who's YSI, what can they do? We incidentally had been financing the, the patent of the, of, on the electrode. And Lee really wanted to, was a, a believe back, but they would do more with it than we would be able to do with it. And so did I, as a matter of fact. And so we really wanted to go with the w wishes of the inventor. So we, we, in effect, gave up the oxygen electrode for the, what we had in it, our raw cost, not even, not even a final cost or a profitable cost. Uh, and that was okay. But in the process, Ray was working in marketing at, at uh, Beckman. And Ray came along on one of the visits to talk about, and Ray seemed to be the most straight-talking of the various Beckman folks that I was dealing with. And so I decided I'd see if I could make him an offer, and I did, and he came. <laughs> and where was Beckman located? Um, in the Santa Ana County, California, California yeah, Southern, South, Southern California. So act someone actually moved from California to Ohio <laughs> oh, yes. for a professional... Yeah, oh, yeah. And Lee was uh, Ray wasn't sure. Ray and, and Corky weren't sure about uh, Yellow Springs, so they rented a house in Xenia. After a year, Ray said, "You know, we're moving up to Yellow Springs. There's a great cultural gap between Springs and Xenia, and we're on the wrong side of the gap." <laughs> great. <laughs> Interesting way to put it. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I remember that very well. Eight. Yes. We, there are some things I want to talk about. Good. Uh, coming up with the uh, super stable thermistors and, for me, more importantly, the gallium melt cell, which, you know, that's a primary point on the international temperature scale. Yeah. This point. Yeah. yeah. That's hard for people to understand what that means. Yeah. And that's why. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's. Another side, we can edit it out, but you know, it's sort of Lee's contributions probably affect, I don't know, maybe half the world population in some way, but there's there are little pieces that yeah, add up yeah. to it, you know. And how do you, you know, you can't just say it's this great thing that happened, you yeah. know, this little it's, thing that they use every day, and this little thing they use every day, you know, and, and why is I in the same part of it, you know, it just gets into it. Hardy, we've talked about um, John Benedict and uh, We've talked some about Lee, and there were others there at the beginning of YSI. 
Yeah, well, Dave Jones. Dave was the son of the Antioch pastor, Bishop Jones. Bishop Jones had been unfrocked by the Episcopalians in World War. He was bishop of the state of Utah, which probably meant he had a relatively small congregation. <laughs> yeah. But anyhow, was a Bishop woman. Jones was a pacifist during, in, during World War I, and the Episcopalians didn't like that, so he got demoted. Uh, he, he was a great pastor, and I, he fed Antioch to a T. And on the side, he would run for governor of Ohio on the socialist ticket. And, and um, he sounds, that makes him sound like a fireball, but he wasn't. He was the most gentle, thoughtful guy I may have run into. Extremely light touch person, but it was obvious that he had a, a, he had a steel core somewhere in there. Anyhow, Dave went to Antioch, and incidentally, Benedict Case Trollander and um, they, we all knew each other as students. We, we were friends before we went into the service. And uh, Jones and Case chose the Navy, Benedict and Trollander chose the Air Force. Um, <coughs> Dave was doing graduate work in chem engineering at Ohio State. He graduated from Antioch, heard about what Benedict and I were planning, and decided he'd like to join us. Uh, so we here we had electrical, mechanical, and chemical. What the hell? We had the whole spectrum. We could do anything. <coughs> and uh, uh, but uh, Jones fairly soon lost interest in YSI. Jones incidentally was doing the accounting uh, for YSI, and such as it was. And I'm sure I'm sure we never accounted for anything accurately. We we did not have the Enron complex. It was quite the <laughs> other way around. We didn't want to do anything with it. But uh, Jones got more and more taken with outside interests, including uh, recording, and he was recording uh, a lot of early Dixie, Dixieland around this area, and uh, an orchestra called the Gin Bottle Seven, and so. <laughs> Gin Bottle 7. Yeah. And so uh, I think I may even have one of the records, too. But anyhow, uh, Jones was more and more absent. And so here was Benedict with these odd hours, and Jones absent a great deal also. So finally Jones decided to leave, and he went to New York and did a lot of, of uh, independent recording. Uh, Mary late in life now lives in Bucks County. Pennsylvania and gets back here every now and then. Uh, we had known Dave Case. Dave had gone on to grad school at Northwestern and was working for a camera company up there that his father was the general manager of the operation, manufacturing operation. And uh, Dave was uh, burning the candle at both ends a little bit too much and came down here one weekend just as a pure escape for a few days. Well, he never left. <laughs> and so Dave brought uh, his experience working at the XL Camera Company was uh, something that made him quite familiar with, ma with manufacturing. And so when we got into things that, like the camera timer, Dave was a real uh, mainstay in the manufacturing end of the, of the business. So he came in the summer of 49, and as you know, he's still here. Yes. And did he, did he retire before? About the same the time. About, about the, the same, same time. time. And that was in? 86. 86. That you both retired? Yeah. Now, I... Uh, Malta joined the company in 85. I remained as CEO, but he was president until um, 86. We had developed a, uh, a rollover succession plan. It was, it, it, the common wisdom then was people ought to retire and get out of the way at age 65. And we operated on that basis. I question that since, but nonetheless, uh, of the five of us who were the operating heads of the company, 
we were all within plus or minus a year of each other, and so it looked as if we had to come up with a process rather than just let it happen. Who were the five at that time? Uh, Ray Schiff, Dave Case, Joel Lander, Henry Sussman, and John Powers. Uh-huh. Incidentally, talking about other products, I would like to jump way ahead to what I think was one of the neatest things that happened, and that was the gallium nut cell. Uh, Henry had uh, operate, been operating a small company in New Jersey, which we acquired, and Henry didn't want to stay in New Jersey, so we moved the company immediately to Yellow Springs. They made platinum resistance thermometers, industrial thermometers, and so it was complementary to the thermistor business. Uh, and Henry had some neat ideas about quality. He believed very, very strongly in quality. Most of the time when in business, when people talk quality, they really mean money first and then quality second. But Henry was quality and YSI was the same way, so we were a good fit that way. Henry came in to, and Henry operated our standards laboratory and got us in close communication with the National Bureau of Standards. And uh, they'd already asked me to be on their advisory board for a couple of terms, and so I had worked with them as well. And both Henry and I really enjoyed, this was an ego trip for both of us, our association with the Bureau of Standards. Uh, Henry came in to see me one day and he said, you know, we might be able to come up with a new standard or two. What do you, what, off the top of your head, what do you think might be needed? And I said, well, something that would be closer to the physiological temperature, closer to 37 degrees C, and easy to to uh, uh, use as a standard. Henry came back after a while with gallium, which is a little bit below 30 degrees C as pure metal, and started working on that. and. Uh, first gallium came from the Marseille refinery of Alu Suisse uh, as a by byproduct of aluminum. Uh, gallium was a, is a very stable element and it, it melts at a very convenient temperature. So he built a few cells and they worked pretty well. We published on the melt point. The Art Bureau of Standards published about a month or two later and the uh, Bureau of uh, Standards Laboratory of the GDR, German Democratic Republic in Berlin, published a month or two after that. Henry and I breathed a sigh of relief when we took a look at all three sets of numbers and they were close enough together. <laughs> 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 we're, we're sweating it, you know. Oh yeah, I'm sure. But that turned out to be an extremely stable melting point and it has become a primary point on the international temperature scale, and the thing that really freaks me about it is Henry coming in to see me and what can we come up with a standard? We'll get some something closer to cycle that physiological zero. And the standard that was closest to that was the triple point of water. And Dorothy, this is a beauty. It's a cell where you get the right conditions to have the, all three phases of water manifest itself, the liquid, the solid, and the vapor simultaneously. And that defines 0 0.01 degrees Celsius. Uh, and it's one of, the, one of the most elegant things in physics. And you would really get turned on by seeing how the ice metal in there and the vapor and the liquid. And, uh, but it takes a, it's, it's hard to measure, it's hard to set up. It's quite hard to measure. And so this simple little melting point of gallium has displaced that elegant cell. <laughs> <laughs> and it's simple again, which is, you know, it's, it's right. also a, a, a theme that goes through. Yeah, but the Hartlock machine is basically a simple approach to it. Yes. Yeah. As opposed mm -hmm. to some of the that are using nowadays, which yeah. they're going back to some of the technology that was used in the original. The O2 cell is basically simple, to Google cells, basically yeah. simple, yeah. even though people took 20 years to do them, and yeah. same with the other ones. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So again, the simpler the thing, the longer the going to be the life of the product, 
the simple with those saying, I, you know, I, I used to drive myself nuts trying to come up with an answer to some of these problems. Like, what the hell is nature trying to tell me, I'd say. Because <laughs> it's all there in nature. You know, nature's anticipated all this stuff. And uh, so the closer to nature, the longer life the product mm -hmm. is going to be, going to have. So um, the... <laughs> So the invention part has to do with first the discovery part and then putting those discoveries together in a simple way. Yeah. I'm the non-scientist here, clearly, and, and so that's, I, I, I'm a little self-conscious about saying these things this way because I don't want to I don't want to trivialize the serious and complex nature of of what of what occurred and what continues to occur. But yeah, the more the more we can simplify, minimize the complexity, the closer we get to reality. But I mean, what, YSI is known for its inventions, and yet what you say is what you just said was what is nature trying to tell me? which sounds more like discovery than invention. Oh, that's all so, inventions come from nature. Yes. You, you know, you're worried about atomic energy? Look at that great big atomic furnace going up there. Yes, yes. Uh, you, go ahead. Yeah, uh, there are some very simple steps in the inventions that Work well for YSI, and and Lee's invention of the o oxygen electrode was a very very simple step. <coughs> there had been polarograph electrodes, and they were getting poisoned by their being directly in contact with the material that they were trying to measure. Lee found out something that uh, that uh, the film was oxygen permeable. So they said, oh, we'll just put that film in front of the electrode between that and the medium, and that did it. That just kept the bad stuff out and let the measurement be made. And it was a, so it was a very simple concept. And, you know, it was the sort of concept when Lee described it to me, I knew immediately that that was invention. I could just yeah. see that, you know. Mm -hmm. And it just stood out like a sore thumb before nothing, after Invention. Invention. Yeah. Well, Alan, you wanted to talk more about oh, inc that. Oh, inc incidentally, Lee got his plastic film from what was then Luttrell's Market, <coughs> now Weaver's, now Tom, now Tom. Yeah. to begin with for those electrodes. So, bread oh. Bas uh, bread container, right? I mean, a plastic bag for bread, wasn't it, or something like that? No, I think it was, I think they were wrapping, uh, using polyethylene to wrap meat in. Oh, like okay. It, whatever. It was... He found it in the market. <laughs> you wanted to go back Start earlier, that one, yeah. Start that one and, and see it, just follow that process. So, of the oxygen electrode. Yeah, yeah. Let's do that. Well, well, I thought we did. Did we? No, not from the real start. You know, with Lee Walker. Oh, you you just described it, but, you know, yeah. it's a, a order of events in that description were... Uh, Okay. Did, what, what was the what was the necessity what, yeah, that there, was the mother yeah, invention? Yeah. Yeah, and that is clear. Lee had w worked out this oxygenator design to oxygenate the the uh, venous blood to put it back in uh, the body, but he but there was no way of knowing how well oxygenated the blood was, and so the motivator for the Clark electrode was a device that could measure the oxygen tension in the blood before and after it went through the oxygenator. So you could see what was the oxygen level before it was oxygenated and how much more oxygen was in it after it had gone through the oxygenator. And that was very, and I'm glad you brought that up, that was very, very clear mm -hmm. necessity was the mother invention. So who drove that? You know, did Lee say, I, we need something here, and here's the, the basis of it? 
Lee that exists Lee, in the world now? Lee drove it from beginning to end. John was doing machining for him, but conceptually and execution-wise, it was all Lee's. So John got into this one, too? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so the first oxygen electrode, uh, physically, is a combination of John and Lee. The business end, the exciting end, was all Lee. But what need, was needed to back it up and make the rest of it practical was John made a number of contributions. How long did it take? I don't know. I would say no more than five or six months at the most. From conception to execution to a, to a, to a product uh, to an experimental device that worked. Yeah. And for a long while, we considered that that electrode was exper experimental, and so we didn't put a product number on it. Still that way, I think. A number of years ago, I asked someone to evaluate the various oxygen electrodes on the basis of the figure of merit, and the first one was the one that had the highest figure of merit. Hmm. But it's not, you didn't, you, YSI doesn't manufacture it? Oh, yes. Yes. Yeah. But doesn't have a product number? It may now, but it didn't for all the time I was in there. Ray didn't want to give it a product number. For, for some reason, Ray f figured it was experimental and it wasn't going to last. <laughs> ah. <laughs> and there was a basis for that. But uh, anyhow, uh, it did go to Beckman. We did. I was insistent on our being able to be responsive to the customers uh, at, responsible for the electrodes we had sold. And so Beckman allowed us how we could continue to do that, but we couldn't make manufacture any instrumentation. One of Beckman's uh, carrots for Lee was that obviously Beckman's patent department was way ahead of this little outfit, Marshall Beeble, French and Bug in, in uh, Dayton, had been Kettering's patent attorneys, incidentally. So anyhow, they uh, took over the patenting. And they uh, claimed too much. They claimed a, a uh, claim that uh, appeared to claim a CO2 electrode that had been developed at Ohio State. And eventually that got the pat basic patent kicked out because one firm who was supposed to be paying royalties to Beckman and Lee challenged it. And it got to one of the High Court of Appeals and was, uh, was bounced out. You mean the Clark Electro? The patent for the, the patent. Yeah, yeah. So it is not a patented. Yeah, they, they were able to go back and patent on narrower grounds, but uh, but the patent would not have been kicked out if we had continued the pursuit because we would not have tried to cover somebody else's work. Right. And again, we were close enough to Ohio State; we knew it was going on. Maybe back then, I don't know. Yeah. Um, the the relationship between uh, Lee Clark and YSI was a long, a long time, a long relationship, beginning in about 1951. Yes. 1950, 49. And going through. I presume there's still some relationship, but I'm not. I'm we'll entirely out. out of YSI right. at this stage of the game, and I don't know. Right. And how did it actually work? I mean, in in detail, did Lee have a physical space at YSI? Did you have any regular meetings? Did you? He came and went. He, he would come to YSI fairly often, but mostly we would be working with him over in the in the biochem laboratory in the basement of Fells. And remember that Lee had an extremely well equipped lab with a staff of several people who were very solid. Phil, Phyllis Fox was one who was a real devotee, and uh, we didn't. We were a crude little outfit. The, uh, the the developing of this 
thing for more, making interchangeable, more, more pockets. interchangeable <laughs> oh, I thought was going to resulted. We needed something that didn't require, we didn't know how to make precision temperature control baths and things to do all that measurement. So once they got the comparison notion, got away from the need for all of that. And that allowed uh, something to get started on the cheap with very little infrastructure. If I was to do it over again, of course, I could do it a lot easier with $50,000 worth of infrastructure. We didn't know what that infrastructure was or how to use it at that point, so this thing was, was on the cheap and very direct. Uh, a good deal of, of our work with, with Lee involving things like that. And did you have, did you have contracts and uh, I mean, I'm trying to visualize, yes Lee no. comes yeah. in to your office and says, or maybe it maybe doesn't work this way, but, and says, you know, I have this idea. Or you go down to Lee's lab and say, Lee, I've been thinking about this. What do you think? Uh, I mean, how did it actually well, occur? Well, we had a number of, we were working principally with Lee and with the Lacy's at Fells, and we just had continuous working arrangements. Uh, sometimes we build them, sometimes we didn't. If, if they wanted a particular piece of apparatus, we would give them a price on that and then produce it at that price. And Stan Garn, incidentally, was another participant. He's been up at Ann Arbor for many, many years. Uh, but how did we work? It was so informal, Dorothy, that I can't pin it down for you. Uh, a good deal of the work that John was doing on that oxygen electrode, I don't think we got paid for. A good deal of the temperature work that I was doing with Lee, we didn't get paid for. We just saw something in it that in one way or another aroused our self-interest. And uh, sometimes that paid off and sometimes it didn't. Yeah. And your accounting people didn't jump down your throat and say? Well, Dave J Jones was doing the accounting, and he wouldn't jump down anybody's <laughs> throat on any accounting. <laughs> well, I mean, but yeah. later on, the... Well, but later on, by the time the later on really occurred, uh, that was getting to the point where Lee and Les Sontag had their run in, and Lee left the area. So you got to remember that, that Alan used the business of coincidence something like this, and that's the way it was. There was not a long, continuous relationship with Lee. There was continuity, but over, over a series of events rather yes. than a continuum. Mm -hmm. He left and was, I don't know, probably had it here someplace, but about when did he leave? I think he left in about 58 or 59, okay. but I would have to do, I haven't done my homework on that. We can ask Lee. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Lee, uh, by all means, yeah. Did we have any contact with him between then? I know we had contact with him in the late 60s, because that's when I got into the picture. Yeah. Do we have any contact in those 10 years? Yeah. Uh, Lee would buy stuff from us, and, and we would, uh, we both had an interest in the Clark Electrode royalties that were going to Beckman, and Beckman in turn to, back to Lee. Uh, so that that maintained a contact, not a this close contact. He was he, in Alabama. Yes, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And incidentally, one of the things I'm proudest about Lee, uh, when I introduced him when he was uh, inducted into Dayton's uh, Hall of Fame, Science and Engineering Hall of Fame, I allowed us when he was down at the, at the med school of Alabama that uh, he integrated the cafeteria down there. I'm not sure that the engineers club folks were near, nearly as moved by that as I had been. I thought that was a terrific move on the East Park. Yeah. I remember he spoke of it at an, at an Antioch commencement when he was... Oh, mm -hmm. Yeah. And that, that certainly would have been something that this Antioch connections we're proud of. Yeah, well, Lee never has felt that he had to fit into a particular mold. <laughs>
That's an Can understatement. You... <laughs> <laughs> Way understatement. Yeah. Can you talk to us um, about what you know of the relationship between Lee and Eleanor? Or your knowledge of Eleanor? My impression. I'll say impression rather than, than knowledge. My impression was that uh, Eleanor was a keel, was a rudder for Lee. That Eleanor would sort of, very with a very, very light touch, kind of keep him in line. And Lee took advantage of that and would go out, get out of line, in other words. But, uh, Knowing. Yeah, yeah. I think I, that's my impression. That's my impression. And there, there were times at YSI, for example, where uh, I would do the same thing as Lee, but with respect to YSI, because I knew Dave Case would be watching. <laughs> yeah, that's Did she have a science background, do you know? Well, she was an Antioch graduate, but I don't, I don't know what it was in. Right. But she's a very sharp person. Yeah. Very good she, compliment, yeah. yeah. She seemed in some ways to be not a lab assistant, but a, a very involved in the work that he did. Yeah. She was very, very seldom at the lab, but she was very much involved. We got to know them in a very interesting fashion. She and I had been married only a little while. They were living in a house over across from what's now Willett. The house is no longer there. But they were living in the upstairs, and there was a nursery school going on, children's center on the first floor of that. Jean was active in that children's center, and Jean and, and uh, Elner would get together for coffee in the morning at 10 o'clock or so. That incidentally was during the time when John Lithgow was going to that nursery school, and Arthur Lithgow came over, explained to Jean that he needed to show John something, and so he took John over to one of the trees and said, John, this is your pee-pee tree. <laughs> And Jean, Jean loved it. She was so charged up. She, she, she thought that was a terrific fatherly thing that he had done. <laughs> but anyhow, so he, she and Eleanor were having coffee. And then after a while, I, Lee and I would come over there at about 10 o'clock, and we'd switch the beer until about 11 o'clock. So that was the association with Lee and Eleanor came about because of that nursery school. The proximity of the nursery school and where they were living. Yes, yeah. Is that when you, but you had known Lee, but you knew Lee before, or not? I can't separate. It, it was close enough so that I can't say. I think I was doing some work with him at Fells. But this is all, well, you know, more than 50 years ago, mm -hmm. sort of all mushed together. Yes. And very, very informal. Yes. <laughs> That's the right. record. Nobody was keeping a log on anything. That's right. That's right. And when Lee returned to this area, it was to Cincinnati, and then the relationship became more, what was the most, let me ask this, what was the most fertile, was there a time that was particularly fertile? Well, I, I'm going to answer that a little bit different. There was okay. a time that was, was dramatic. Mm. And I think uh, Lee had been keeping in touch with Fred Hooven, and Lee had been keeping in touch with me, and Lee asked us to come down one afternoon and in his kitchen with a beaker and a few other odds and ends, he demonstrated what was going to become the glucose electrode. <coughs> Excuse me, this is how you can measure glucose. And we looked at that and we were, both Fred and I were impressed. And the fact that Fred was impressed helped me to be impressed because I figured Fred was a couple steps ahead of me most of the time that way. And uh, so we then began to start work on that with Lee, and that's where Alan came in quite early in that in that uh, game. And uh, again, the concept was so simple it could be demonstrated in somebody's kitchen with a meter, a battery, and some liquid. Uh, it became much more complex, and Lee's. Uh, original manifestation was did not work very well. Uh, Lee conceived of 
to a two electrode system where one would be sensitive to glucose and the second one wouldn't and therefore balance out any irregularity in the first one. Unfortunately, electrochemistry doesn't work that no. well. Every electrolyte doesn't have the same response on every electrode. Yeah, and so it wasn't until Dave Newman came along and he was went to Denmark and picked up something over there. We, we, a number of us went to Denmark at one point and came back and we just put a second membrane in front of the first membrane and solved the problem. Hmm. So that was Newman's invention and again when you looked at that you saw invention right away because it was simple. Um, when I asked you earlier about uh, this question of if you would scroll back, are there things you would have done differently and similarly are there things you would have done, you know, what things would you have done absolutely the same? Um, and you said to me that overall in the largest sense there wasn't anything that you would do differently. Yeah, right. Um, are there things that stand out as particularly important things that you would have done the same, that particularly in hindsight um, led to either particularly satisfying experiences or led to leaps ahead for YSI? Well, on this business of doing things differently, you know, with the benefit of hindsight, but that's cheating. You can't do oh. things differently with the benefit of hindsight, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> but you got to learn from your hindsight. I mean, that's sure. That's yeah. how you go forward. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But you're moving forward rather than backward. Right? Oh, yeah. True. Uh, no. Again, I I I think I was generally pretty overall satisfied with how things went. If it got down to some of the details, sure, I could question some of it, but I'd probably wind up questioning myself more than the detail itself. I don't know. Hmm. Um, the question is, as Alan suggested, for um, more for others than for you. In other words, it may be that some of what we end up with is instructive to other people who are thinking about um, a small company or who are thinking about the principles of, of encouraging creativity. Or so, so yes, it may be cheating, but on the other <laughs> hand, it may be it may be instructive to others. Um, well, I guess looking back on it <coughs> and putting it in today's context, uh, you know. Generally speaking, I think starting a small business is is very, very easy, and the time is, is right now for it, as it was then, as it was a hundred years ago. Uh, and you just, you know, just if if you are so motivated, you can just go out and do it. And so I've I've been doing a fair amount of consulting over the years of small businesses trying to get started. And uh, one of the limitations I've imposed on myself is that if somebody wants me to come in and they're planning a, uh, an initial public offering, an IPO, I'm out of there because I'm a bootstraps type experienced person and I can help out with doing things with your bootstraps, but IPOs, no, no <laughs> they just don't feel right to me at all. <clears throat> Many of those things are good, you know, there's no two ways about it, but that's not my racket. But again, if you if you are trying to get started with a minimum of resources and a maximum of your own effort, then I think I can help out in terms of, of uh, consulting. Mm -hmm. But I've never played what I would think is a key role in getting a business started. Uh, I've been being able to be a supportive for a number of but I can't claim that I was the catalyst that made things work. Um, well, another thing that goes through my experiences is the diversity of people. Uh, 
for example, you know, Ray Schiff with a chemistry background being marketing, uh, you know, you always had a, a different, uh, people didn't have to be in the discipline they were in, or yeah. they all didn't have to be in the same discipline. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Ed Malloy again, who was, not again for the first time, but anyway, Ed Malloy, who was a chemist background, ended up being, you know, loving to do electronics, and then got yeah. into electrochemistry, getting into the mechanical parts of building things and stuff like that. You know, it just, people weren't, I find it when I put out a resume, you know, okay, what are you? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? yeah. I'm not, you know, I'm not. That's right. We were. We, we weren't. We weren't. That's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think Alan's got, is, is key to that. Uh, Henry Sussman was a uh, philosophy major. Who became a metrologist and became a very, very profound metrologist. Not meteorologist, metrology, yeah. measurement science. Yeah. Yes. Uh, now, he wasn't here for a very long time, was he? Uh, about 12 years. Oh, was it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. He ended up contributing to the, the gallium and all the standards lab, and he ended up contributing to the glucose because we needed the QA at the time. Yes. We had no medical QA That's in right. the glucose sense because we were getting into chemistry solutions and everything else. The thermistors, we had our own QA, which was a different kind of thing. Yeah, and Henry knew how to structure that sort mm -hmm. of thing. Probably. And how to deal with the FDA, which we, had yes. to, we hadn't. Yeah. So they were just getting into the the new regulations of the FDA, devices. and he walked us through that, which is yeah. extremely important. Yeah. Yeah. I had been instrumental. I, as uh, uh, Hewlett Packard and YSI and one or two other companies met with the FDA while they were trying to formulate their medical devices. And I always felt that something was necessary in that area. So we went, went there not to argue our case, but to be work with them cooperatively. Mm -hmm. Came up with some pretty good regulations and for me one of the one of the things that I'm most proud of was that when they were first ready to pull an FDA inspection, we got a call from the Cincinnati office. Would we mind if they came and we both explored what this meant and what we could learn about it? And so I, we said sure, come on up. And we worked hand in hand with the FDA to Here's what we know. They were saying, "Here's what we know. Let's put this together." So it was extremely a cooperative setup. The original design of the uh, regulations at the time are not what they're using now. And basically, we went through the way it was set up. I think the right number is 510K, yeah, which is the grandfathering meant that you just showed how you were just a small change from the past. Mm -hmm. Well, that is probably, I'll bet, 90% of the way things go through today is sure. through that. And we probably, I'm guessing, did the first one. Yeah, I, I think you're probably right. Yeah. 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 Which, you know, everybody wants to grandfather it through now because you don't have to make, you know, have to prove the basic science, which is what yeah. the FDA thought you would want to do. Oh, we've got to prove it, basic science and build this on it. And nobody wants to take all that effort. Like, it's just a little change from this. Yeah. <laughs> now, here I will let my ego show very, very profoundly. One of the things that I'm most proud of was the statement by a senior Hewlett Packard executive many years ago that Yellow Springs was the conscience of the industry. Yes. Yeah. Well, that's certainly, uh, I keep thinking about the Antioch connection. I keep thinking about the first the people who are drawn to Antioch to begin with and then get to Antioch and get that message about be afraid to die before you have made some could claim some victory for humanity and it does seem to me that there is that that, that sense of things informed why I mm -hmm. Seriously, profoundly informed by as I. Well, let me give you my impression of a couple of things that happened there. First of all, uh, there was Antioch's encouragement of entrepreneurialism and of invention. 
Uh, and then there was Antioch's encouragement of uh, social progress. And so over the years, and you know, this didn't develop immediately, but over the years in attempting to identify what areas of risk we would get engaged in, we decided, well, I decided that we wanted to bring new measurement science into new measurement engineering, measurement technology, and our se second area of risk would be in personnel practices. And having those two areas, the rest, we, we decided that we better be conservative elsewhere. There was enough risk in both of those for, and so cons I was very conservative in the financial operation of YSI. Hmm. But uh, we probably were the first company in Ohio, maybe the first company almost anywhere, to introduce flex time to production workers. And uh, there's an interesting story about that one that I like to tell. We had been uh, having group flex time for groups of people who worked together. And that was, seemed to be working out okay for about a year. And then people began coming in and complaining to Dave Case and me. Dave was head of manufacturing. And uh, they were complaining because they were, happened to be in the minority of a group that chose a certain set of hours. Mm -hmm. And by God, management really ought to tell us what to do, you know. <laughs> you tell us what hours we're supposed to work. And that happened about twice, I guess. And one thing at the end of that, Dave and I were looking at each other, and Dave sort of grinned, and he said, how about we go to individual flex time? And I thought for a moment, since this was coming from the head of manufacturing, sure, let's do it. So we, so we did it. And we also recognized that it was going to come down hardest on the first-line supervisors who'd been used to programming their people very precisely. So we worked in a core time and we worked in, uh, and then we worked with the first line supervisors because they were the people who had adapt the most. And some did very readily, some didn't, but after a while they all, they all did. Why as I still operates on that basis. And, and are there wild fluctuations in time or is there pretty much a well, there's a core time. There's a fairly broad band where it's okay for you to come in in the morning, and fairly broad band where it's okay for you to leave in the evening. Uh, and you're supposed to work up to 40 hours. You don't have to hold yourself to eight hours a day. So a lot of people work uh, nine hours for four days and then just half a day on Friday, mm -hmm. production area. So it gives you two and a half day weekend instead of that. And uh, that works out okay. And it works out okay in terms of the people who have to coordinate with each other? I mean, that it seems to me to be well, a the, big... Well, remember, uh, YSI is not a production line. You can't do that on, at uh, Honda and Marysville. No. I don't know. Maybe you can, but nobody's figured out how to do it yet. But with YSI, it was always small batch production. and. Uh, in, instead of continuous. Thermistors came pretty close to being continuous, but you, you could control the number, number of steps on that so that you could go to the flex time. So I, I won't say that it's, it could be extrapolated to all forms of yeah. manufacturing. But well, my only experience with flex time was when I was uh, managing editor at the Antioch Review, and um, flex time had to do with Larry Grauman being a night person and me being a day person uh -huh. and um, it was you know I needed some decisions made and yep. he didn't get up and start shaving until three in the afternoon so <laughs> sure. it was a it was yeah. a, not so easy and of course this was a primitive and and a, and a small situation and I just thought you know what if the mechanical engineer needs to talk to the electrical engineer and he doesn't come in until there's there's their core hours. First of all, when you get the salaried folks and you get the technical people, you you generally have flex time. You may not recognize it officially, but people are going to work that way. Some will work in a very disciplined, time disciplined fashion. Others won't. And you you got to you got to allow for yeah. those variations. Yeah. No, I think yeah. And you want a mixture. Back to my mixture again. Yeah. Yeah. You sort of have to have the focus people for organizing things and yes. making sure that the, there are people to talk to there. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah.
But generally it worked well is the point. As far as I know, it's still working well. Yeah, generally it worked well. Yeah. But it's not as undisciplined as it sounds. Yes. No, I'm sure not. Yeah. And, and you did have to let people know about when you were coming and going. Sure. And there was, there was core time, so engineers always knew when they could talk to production people and other engineers and salespeople, what have right. you. Yeah. Now we could go off, off, we could continue that kind of thought with the non layoff policy. You wanna, mm. That was interesting to live through. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure we'd had a layoff in 1955 when we'd been involved in too many Air Force contracts and the Huffy bicycle radio and uh, all of a sudden there was no work, and that was was not pleasant. If you're living in a small town, you're laying off your friends and neighbors. You're not laying off some faceless folks out there. Uh, so we weren't faced with that again until the 70s, early 70s, and there was a hiatus in our business uh, that was worldwide. And uh, I happened to hear a, a women's program on WOSU talking about work sharing, and they described a means of how we could do how to do this. And so we came up with a with a model that saw us on a five-week cycle. The first week we laid off the people with the lowest, lowest seniority for one week, and then they came back the second week, the next group, and at the same time, we cut all salaries by 10%. Now, we were reducing production by 20%, but once we got through the first cycle of having been, uh, then the people could collect in unemployment insurance the second time they were off. Oh. So it, in effect, brought their pay up to the 90% level, which was, we were trying to equalize, and we were going in we were really trying for equality like crazy, Dorothy, trying to equalize the effect on salaried people and on hourly people, and we cut the dividend by the same amount. <laughs> Some of the board did not like that. <coughs> but I was of the opinion, no, the dividend ought to suffer first, but I couldn't get, <laughs> get couldn't that agreement. Couldn't get agreement on that. <laughs> so anyhow, there was still a little bit of socialist in the, you know, coming out. Uh, so that, uh, that worked very well, and when we get, came time to come off of it, Dave and I were discussing this, and, and I forget which one of us suggested it, but we figured that, well, rather than come off of it all at once, uh, let's come off it a week early, and then carry it over a week farther, and give the people who are going to be affected at that point the choice of coming back or not. Because we figured a lot of them made some plans. Well, half came back and half didn't. Which, as far as I was concerned, if you get a 50-50 response like that, you locked into something good. Yes. <laughs> and how long did you... If this went on for about 10 weeks, my, my memory is it could have gone on for 15. I, but it was, it was no longer than 15 weeks, all told. But nobody... <coughs> Everybody's income was maintained to the 90% level. Hmm. Did that twice? Yeah. Second time was uh, uh, Malta. No, I thought we did it twice under you. And then Malta did the third one. I thought there was one in the I it was, early 80s or someplace. Well, there was one in the Middle Ages, 80s. I was still around, but well, I think Malta was yeah. was president, but not CEO. Okay. Yeah. There was another um, one. It was very similar, but I don't know whether it lasted, didn't last very long or what. I, uh, I don't trust my memory for that kind of thing. Arb, so okay. I don't want to argue. Yeah. And then there was the an, another um, another relatively new move in making it an employee-owned company. Yeah, we worked, we worked that in gradually. Uh, again, we were still 
carrying forward this notion of a semi-engineering commune was in the background. And uh, I'd got some semi-professional board members, and they really helped straighten YSI out, but they were also conservative business types. And uh, so I talked about stock ownership, and they really weren't interested. And Jerry Sterling, who put together this product line, was really very much interested in some ownership in the company. And, and I used his accomplishments as a lever, so Jerry became the first additional employee to get stock. And then gradually we added various people to that, and then finally took the, the final step of going to a full ESOP employee stock ownership plan where everybody with a year of seniority was a part of that. Mm -hmm. But when I retired, apart from the ESOP people, we had a little over 200 stockholders, a number of whom were not employees because we didn't put any strings on the stock. They could sell it if they, without leaving the company if they wanted to. We didn't have a buyback arrangement. And so a number of people did sell to other, other folks, mm -hmm. various people in the community. Well, Sunday I knew him. Pardon? Les Sontag, I think, had YSI stock. As I'm I not sure. I'm not sure. If he did, he, he, he got it from some employee, not directly. Yeah. I thought that was part of his gift to the Community Foundation, some YSI stock. Maybe I'm wrong. I don't, Maybe don't not. think so. Oh, well, you I'm know better sure. than I. But I do know that, it, that there are people in the community who... Yeah. Who own YSI stock? Yeah, and uh, I've donated a couple of times to different folks if, as, under the circumstances where I knew that YSI would would buy it back. I would make it as a charitable donation. Yeah. Well, it seems to me we've done a lot this morning. Oh yeah. We'll and um, I it, that it's maybe time to wind up. Yeah, did you want a shot of his device that he brought with him? Oh, yeah, I'll show him. Yeah, he didn't really... Oh, well, you can do that right on camera, then. That's yeah. what I was thinking, yeah. Good. You mean like... Yeah, we talked about <laughs> it. We talked about yeah. it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one of the first telethermometers. This stayed in production for more than 40 years. I've got the last one at home that... <laughs> was, was signed by everybody who had hand oh, oh. Could you tilt it forward for me just a little bit? It's got a little glare there. Sure. That's fine. Yeah. That's perfect. Yeah.